Good evening. This is the premier issue of the Eye of the Storm podcast. I'm kicking off this new podcast with a series of big picture updates. The first part of that today will cover the S&P cash market, the SPX, uh, and also the ES, and also the NASDAQ, NDX cash market, as well as the futures market, the NQ. So the purpose of what I'm doing is, again, presenting that, the equity markets, in our first podcast. The next podcast will be the interest rate markets. And then the third podcast will be on the precious metals, gold and silver. They are all very uniquely tied to one another. And it seems that a whole flurry of events are coming to a head, so to speak, that is going to involve all of the above. So it will involve the equity markets, the interest rate markets, and the dollar or so currencies, as well as the precious metals. So they're very intertwined. Right now, I'm going to begin with the S&P 500, the SPX, which is an index that I have a data to start my maximum picture, my very long-term picture, which begins on the chart back in January of 1928. So nearly 200 and at least four years of data that we have right now to digest. So the, and the reason I'm starting here is to show you the size of the impulse waves within these larger moves. And then of course, what we would expect in a corrective wave in these larger cyclical moves. So beginning here with the S&P where we have the data, I am looking at the cash market as being in the completion point for a super cycle wave three. And that would be all the way up here at our current high at 4,808. Now, if we have any understanding of Elliott, the largest degree is just finishing the largest portion of its cycle advance, super cycle advance, we'll call it. And so what that tells us right now is that on that super cycle degree level, we are now getting ready to, if not have already dropped into the infancy stage of a longer term super cycle degree fourth wave. And the first thing that we need to understand is that it's just the fourth wave out of five. So we've already now done on that super cycle level, super cycle wave one, wave two, that happened in 1932 at, at bottom. So the rally on a super cycle degree coverage, the cycle of the whole thing, is truly for super cycle wave three began in 1932. So we're considering that it's now 90 years old. 90 years old. That's what the rally that's going to be corrected. So it encompasses, well, way past my lifetime, most people that are listening, our, our parents in many cases, and of course, in many, many cases, our grandparents. So this takes many, many generations to fulfill. And, that, and this third wave was the longest and the strongest part of the entire cycle, which is still, still has at some point more upside to do. But first we have a fourth wave correction to put in on a very large cyclical basis. And one thing that Elliot tells us very quickly, is that when you're dealing with this very, very large picture, we must keep things in perspective that we're in a super cycle wave for possibly beginning corrective decline. And it's within an ongoing super cycle degree impulse, five waves impulse up. So, but being that there's such long-term cycles, we're going to correct for a while. The, <clears throat> 
most common area for a fourth wave of one degree to come back to is the fourth wave of one lesser degree. And that would be the cycle degree. And cycle degree four finished at about 700, let me get this right, 750, we'll call it maybe down to 700. And we're now sitting at above 45. So we begin to look at this like, what are we talking about here, Michael? What's, what's really going on? And that is the ultimate, ultimate point to which the market may get to within the next 10 to 13 years. That's a long time, a long trading time. This was nine years. This was a cycle degree, corrective wave, took nine years. So this fourth wave may only get to here, bounce back up and then come back, but this might be it for the entire thing because the pattern will dictate what is going on. Again, <clears throat> this is a very, very big picture. And I'm now updating this in the cash market so that we can get to up to this point. So I feel that we have completed the cycle wave five, <clears throat> excuse me, and in turn, the super cycle wave three. So there is the cycle five, and above this would be the super cycle wave three. So what we're showing now is the internals within this cycle fifth wave. <clears throat> we have to be able to count five waves of primary degree. Remember, Elliott wave, as constructed by R.N. Elliott, they are building blocks from your the largest picture down to your smallest picture. They repeat, 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 and continue to repeat all the way down to the 30 second chart, to a tick chart, et cetera, et cetera. They continue to repeat. Now, with that in mind, within a cycle degree fifth wave, considered an impulse, there will be five waves of primary degree. Now, within each impulsive section, waves one, three, and five, there will also be five wave moves of intermediate degree. Then if we go down further within the intermediate degree run, there'll be five waves of minor degree and they're all very, very countable. We're now sitting on a monthly chart. So you can see how we continue to work down, work down, work down. So we can always see where we are within this larger picture. Okay, so now within cycle wave five, which is what's happening here, there's five waves of primary degree. There's primary one, two, three, four. That was March 2020, where the, NAT, uh, the SPX the, lost 38% of its value real quickly in about three weeks. And then that was a primary fourth wave. And then we rallied up to that high at 4808. And that completed primary wave five. And then in turn, one higher, it completed the cycle wave five. And one higher, it completed the super cycle wave three. Now I can bring this down even more, down to a weekly chart. And now we can see we've reached up because within primary wave five, there had to be five waves of intermediate degree. And again, so on and so forth as we break it down. Here is the intermediate one, two, three, four, and five. So there's the completion of intermediate five, the primary five, a cycle five, and a super cycle wave three. Major high in, in my opinion. Now, what we start to look for coming off is a development, at least on a weekly chart, at least five waves down. And this happened to come through on a minor degree. So I'm gonna drop down to the daily chart now. And now we're gonna just figure if we're calling this a five of five of five of three, then we have begun what should ultimately be three waves down of cycle degree. And actually three waves down of super cycle degree, to be honest with you. So, but it's a very long term and it's a very large and it's a very, can be very deep corrective phase for the equity markets and specifically the SPX. So here we go. So within on a daily, 
chart, even on the hourly chart, I start to look for confirmation by a, an initial five waves down, which I got on the daily chart right there. So on, on the hourly chart, we're gonna go down and I've gotta go back up to the four. On the four hourly chart, I'll be able to see that move. There it is. So much, much nicer when you start to bring it down to the lower levels. Back to that daily. So what I begin to look for is five waves down. But now I'm looking for it on a minor degree. There's minor one, two, three, four, and then five. Now, initially, this was not as clean as it turned. And you're going to notice that wave five is not really coming in at the bottom there at 4101 is the essential low in the futures market. Here in the cash market, 4114. And in actuality, it's over here. So what I had to do, because this also presented a problem, and here's four, here's one, they're overlapping. Very often, when you discuss or try to work a Elliott count, then what becomes important is what, what happens to these bars on a closing basis. And so what I've done is I've turned it down to a line chart, which is basically a closing basis for the chart. And then from here, I can see one is well above four. I can see that where I placed it at 4170 is the low for intermediate wave one, even though I think that this wave coming off did not exceed it. So therefore it gets to be put in as a wave two. This is 70 and this is 73. So now we have that intermediate wave one. And if you've been following my daily analysis, we are within a intermediate wave two. And within that, I've just actually completed the five up to do the A wave. And that high came in on the 29th at 4631. And we dropped 100 off of that uh, between then and the 31st uh, with the market rallying, a little finishing higher on April the 1st. So what, where we are is the market is still going to take some time, according to how I got it labeled, where we're going to come down in a B wave now and then still rise within a C wave. But if I put up just some very basic parameters, and I'll go into detail on this uh, on tomorrow's update, which will specifically be for the ES and one for the NASDAQ. Uh, All right. So we're gonna go do this again so that I can get this done. And put up the, the, the Fibonacci. And these are just the retracements. So we're looking at a minimum retracement, maybe back down to 44.55. That would be 382. And then, but quite often the normal for a B wave is 50 to 618, 50% down to 618% or 62%. And that would be of the length of that A wave. So 50% down is 43, 4400. Down here at 62%, we have 43.45. That's not an unreasonable. And then from there, we would do an additional C wave up, not to exceed that high, but remember the relationship on a Fibonacci basis, if we're trying to measure this out, is that the C wave's most common relationship between the C and the A is that C is equal to 0.618 of A. And so that keeps that high 4808 in place. So I continue right now to look for a B wave decline and then the C wave up to finish intermediate wave two, taking longer than I would have expected, but the market is sitting in a very difficult place. Now, this is where everything else starts to come in. And I can switch this over. I looked at this market at the, at the cash market because I wanted to show the points where I slipped over to the hourly, excuse me, the uh, line chart to show exactly where these lows came in. 
And where this low came in, which is why this gets marked as wave one, and we count this as a five wave structure, labeling it as A, and now looking for a decline. Back down towards 43.45, to be honest with you. We have three or two support zones above it. We have all the moving averages now. You can see they're very congested on the daily, right there. No, that's not correct. They're congested on that daily. Come on. Sometimes they just don't want to work, do they? And I'm going to go back over to the hourly chart and see if I can't pick it up. And it's the daily that's got them all. And that's the one I want to look at. These are all clustered on the daily. And it's important for that daily to hold itself together um, because we could break below the 20, the 50, and the 200 all in one foul day, all in one swoop if it gets going because they're all pretty flat right now. And so they're grouped together. A good shove lower brings them right back and all turning lower here. And that could force the, the additional possible selling down to 43, 45. Check out tomorrow because I'll go into more detail about uh, alternate views. Leave it safe to say that I continue to look at the markets as being in a very dramatic position in terms of what I see coming in front of us. And I'm going to go back to that weekly chart because it gives me a little bit more and I can open it up and we can start to say that that is the low I think wave A will ultimately come to. And again, we're in the cash market. So if we take a look at this here, we have intermediate one. A of intermediate two, we have a B. The alternative to that would be that this is one, two, but I don't know how to count that as a three-way right now. Now, what I am also saying is that this is intermediate one, intermediate wave two, and it's complete. We have intermediate wave three, which should cut right through all of this, all of these moving averages. So I would suspect that wave three is what's gonna to start to bring us down below 4,000 pretty solidly. And we have the weekly 236.12. So these on a little bit longer term, so on a weekly chart, come into play. How hard they hit will depend on what boils over, what tends to turn the, the algorithms from being more positive on the uh, on premium to the calls right now. So that the concern is that, the, or the fear or the thought is that the market continues to go up. When we start to see that shift, which I believe we did start to see some of it last Thursday and Friday, where you start to get that shift in where premium sits over to the puts. Now fragile as it is, because this market can turn and go back up as soon as it wants to. But so when we start to see more of that premium switch, then I'd be looking for lower levels to start kicking in. If again, weekly 50 sits at 43.57, coming back down to that daily picture, we can see that here we sit in that at 44.65 down to 44.44, nice number. So again, right the same area where the weekly and the daily 50 and the cluster sits approximately in the same areas. So we have things. Now, what sits inside of this? We do have a lot going on within the bond market, which I'll cover in the next episode here on this podcast. So but what's going to be important is that we start to remember how low we can get. We start to see the premium change. We start to change the strategies in our mind about where the larger moves will come. And it seems to be switching where the larger moves will come to the sell side. So. I will continue to look for the breaks below the moving averages. I will continue to follow the pattern. And because for whatever reason, folks, I may have to switch this up and that's an ABC and this is it for two and that third wave is beginning. That's how volatile I believe the situation can get. Let me state that as well. I believe the situation can get just as squirrely in the equity markets as it can anywhere where we really start to drop. 
And so those will, that will be the signs of the market is coming to an end. Now, I want to quickly shift over and I want to look at the NDX, same picture, but I want to update what I have here on the max view. And this view goes back to 1984, 85. There's the 1987 crash. I'm marking that as cycle degree, cycle one, cycle two, cycle three, cycle four, cycle five, all the way up here. Now, whether that also then gets marked as a super cycle wave three, that's how I'm viewing it right now, but it doesn't necessarily stick that way because I have to go gather what all the data is basically saying. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, like right now, the cycle wave four was the meltdown, the, the dot com blowout meltdown that we saw starting in 2000 out to 2002. Whereas the financial collapse of 2008, 2009 here in the NASDAQ was primary one and primary two, the high of primary one. And that collapse was basically primary wave two. So there's a little bit of a difference where it was much harder felt in all of the balance of, of the uh, S&P stocks versus what actually took place here. The NASDAQ had its major collapse. So this was the road to recovery and it was just the quick sell-off, which if you study Elliott Wave becomes very <clears throat> important in understanding the characteristics and the personalities of each individual wave as part of a five wave sequence or as part of this three wave sequence if the corrective move is in place. Now, back to the NASDAQ. So here we are in a cycle fifth wave up that began in October of 2002. So we're 20 years into this almost. It's 2022. And where, where should we be reaching this top? Well, by way, the way that I'm counting it, I believe we already have. So let's go down to just the monthly chart. And again, we're back over here. This is primary one and two. This was the 2009 debacle in the financial world. And tech stocks didn't get hit quite as hard, hard enough, but much harder among the banking sector, I guess. In any case, from here, we started into a primary, whoops, third wave. Whoa, this got, well, what happens when you do that? There we go. We got into a primary wave three, which actually then took us up to the top just before the, the pandemic sell-off came in. So that was October, excuse me, March of 2020. So from that four, the primary wave four, first of all, here within primary wave three, we had five waves of intermediate degree as labor. Within this third wave, it subdivided twice and then within those several more times. But if this is intermediate three, I can count out a minor three, and then I can count out a minute five ways up to, to uh, put in another third. So there was three of a three of a three of a three. So it was very well constructed and total fit with what expectations would be of a third wave of that size, and up to here of a third wave of primary size. So we are looking for one last five waves up to complete primary wave five. I believe that has been accomplished. So now I'm gonna come out to the weekly chart. If I can pull that down a little bit, you can see I've got intermediate five, primary five, cycle five. That primary green behind, buried behind all of that is what we're now looking at. Here again, the low from the pandemic low is at 6,772, we'll call it. And from here, this is primary wave four. Now we're looking for five waves of intermediate degree to complete primary five. One, two, three, four, five. Wave three, definitive three waves in, and or five waves within the third, it all fit. Here is our completion point. What degree on the super cycle level is 
I, I'm, I'm right now working with it being a super cycle wave three so that the S&P and the NASDAQ which share so many high priced stocks with heavy weightings that their counts in my mind should be equal. They should be the same. Some of the slight nuances within them maybe unfold a little bit differently, but overall the, on the higher degrees, the, the count should be the same, particularly on a cycle degree and super cycle degree. I'm doing them in conjunction the same. So with here in the NASDAQ, if I come down to a daily, we'll see again, once we find the highs for fifths of fifths of fifth of a third, we're looking for the development of initially five waves down to give us confirmation that yes, we likely are put in the top and now we're going to work our way lower in a corrective phase. So minor degree on a daily chart, one, two, three, four, and five. And once again, some of the internal counts really helped when I slipped over and went to the line chart so that I could see how clean it truly was in terms of how it came down in five and labeled that one. There were other periods of time when I had, at least on a futures basis, I had wave one here and wave two here. And this would have been minor one of three, minor two of three. It really came into play as this second wave launched itself. For whatever reason they had, it still launched itself where on a technical base and according to structure, really was not gonna be a second wave of the degree I was attempting to count. So I, I needed to move this up to the next degree. It's still a first wave. This is still a second wave, but this was a minor one. This is an intermediate one. It's up. It's similar to what you could say, you know, on the Richter scale. It's the, from minor degree to intermediate degree, it's 10 times bigger, let's say. So when I'm looking for this to be a minor ABC, well, maybe down to here it would have been fine. But when it's sitting way up here and it's rallied so strongly, well, then it becomes one degree higher. So again, same situation exists in the NASDAQ as exists in the, in the S&P that exists in the Dow, et cetera. We're all under the same pressure in terms of equities. And that comes down to understanding the pecking order. The pecking order is that we have the interest rates sit at the top of that food chain. And everything else feeds off of those interest rates. We have the dollar, we have bonds, we have equities, we have precious metals, we have commodities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it's follow the money. So interest rates, that's how much we're gonna pay or that's how much we're gonna get when we deal with money at that level. So, that's at play. If we have taken any time to take a look at the two, the five, and the 10 year notes, they've been in a consistent decline, a consistent decline, the two year, a consistent decline for at least the last two months. And that would be a minimum. And they have dropped substantially. So they're now, I guess, getting into a position where it's like, hmm, that one and three quarters that we think that we've now priced into the equity markets may not be sufficient or may not be correct. So when you compare the decline on a chart basis of what's happening in, in the short-term interest rates, it's also happening in the 30-year bond. So it's not so in the 20-year tranches, et cetera, et cetera. So in the bond market itself, it is really telling us some news that we need to pay attention to, as well as what, what's gonna happen to the dollar, what's gonna happen to the price of the bonds, what's gonna happen to the yields, and then how that interrelates to the equity market, to the precious metals markets, and how valid are those associations, those ties to each move being more like Pavlov's dog, where, oh, higher rates, lower gold. Oh, higher rates, lower bonds. Oh, you know, factoring in rate cuts or rate, rate hikes as if that's Bible. So there's a lot of stuff going on. And we're dealing with the shifting of money. 
And within the equity markets, I, I also discuss so that people truly understand that on March the 18th, there was, it was an expiration, it was a monthly expiration. And in that expiration, $3.6 trillion settled. That's how much money settled. Positions that settled resulted in $3.6 trillion in transactions. And that's a lot of money coming on both sides. If it's really being settled and, and you're getting out of a position and you're receiving that money, is that money being put back in the market? Is that money leaving the market? Where is that money going, et cetera, et cetera? $3.6 trillion. So it has a double edged sword. It means there's a lot of trading going on, but it's paying attention to the flow. It's paying attention to really where's the premium. And option trades, it's selling premium. That's the name of the game. And when it gets high, because the volatility is sky high, it becomes even juicier. So money is leaving or is money coming in? If you're selling the premium, you can work that position out to where synthetically you could work it by you're selling the stock. You're selling. And it's a closed position, a totally closed position. You know, you could be a short the call, long the stock, and at some point buy the put and make a ton of money. So there's trading to be done. Let me just say, there's a lot of trading to be done. And so premium, when I start to see it, see it shift to the puts, as I've spoken about, that is where I'm now going to be looking how you're going to position yourself here because that the, the, it's just how the positions are going to go. Sell puts, sell the underlying. Sell puts, sell the underlying. That is the combo. And either it goes off all on its own or they get something added to it or whatever. But it is sell puts, sell the underlying. So professionals will be working on the short. Instead of having to buy stock, you're going to have to sell stock. All right. So NDX, SPX, both in the same position. They have the ability where the market may come down in that B wave, right? This ends intermediate wave one. Same ticket here that this was such a powerful rise in the NDX cash that I'm counting it as five up. And that suggests that it's wave A, minor wave A of intermediate wave two, minor wave B in progress would measure, we'll put that up right now. It'll measure up to, again, this is basis the cash market, minimal 44, 14,400, I'm gonna call it. 50%, 14,136. 618, 13,867. It can come all the way back down there and it would be healthy. It would be healthy. It doesn't mean the end of the world. Again, the market's always gonna be correct. So we gotta let the market do, but is that tradable? It sure is. And you maybe have to do a trade daily, but when it starts to break down, there's gonna be some great day trades via the options, via the futures, et cetera, et cetera. There will be trades. This is a daily chart. It's gotten getting ready to go back below the daily 50. It grabbed above it. We got a nice rise, came back down and got below it on Friday. So, but they managed to close it back above. If it comes back down, breaks, then we're going. Then we know the 50 is up next. That's a lot of room, plenty of trading to do. So Bottom line in all of this, folks, is that number one, there's going to be a ton of trading as we move up and down. Premium is going to be the play. Remember, I approach the market technically. Fundamentally, I can give you a myriad of reasons. They exist. They're out there. To try to figure out at each turn why, who, is it bullish? Is it bearish? Have an overall picture. The longer term picture, to me, continues to spell that what we're doing to the upside while it may be relieving an overbought or oversold situation, it's oversold if they're buying it, then yes, that's acceptable. 
but understand that it's likely corrective. And therefore the turn will be vicious on the, on the way back down. So that's what I'm looking for. This thing, if it's a truly gonna kick off in an intermediate third wave down, I will repeat again and again, it should be swift, hard knockout punch to begin. One that is like, no mistake, make no mistake, we are done, the high is in. And that is normally gonna be kicked off by some news event, something that hits hard enough that it just shocks everybody going, why was I buying? And they reverse. And since things are all algorithmic and things are quantitative, it is the push of a button and the button may not come in and bid. The button is doing it at the market. So we get quicker, we get bigger pushes, et cetera, et cetera. This is kind of what I'm looking for. Tie it in with the other points that I'm going to be making with bonds and interest rates and inflation and how that affects the dollar and what is just the knee jerk reaction versus what really can and probably will happen. And it normally includes both the knee jerk reaction and then the reality reaction. So lots of trading to come, lots. And it's gonna be spread out over many different sectors. Now I'm gonna leave it right here because believe it or not, I'm now almost 36, 37 minutes into it. And I'm trying to keep them under 40. Again, this is the premiere edition of the Eye of the Storm podcast. It's a podcast series that I'm going to be doing by myself to, to introduce it in terms of giving the long-term updates, equities today, and then uh, bonds. I hope to get done tomorrow and then precious metals and gold and silver will also be included. I also help and hope to move this forward enough where I will then be bringing people in to discuss different topics about trading, about counts, about what's happening in our economies and globally. I'm hoping that this all gets expanded and we can become very interesting and have lots of trade ideas coming out for everyone to get a hold of. All right, thank you so much for listening. And I hope that you made it all the way to the end. And if you did, thank you very much. And the next uh, Eye of the Storm podcast will be about the long-term picture and what happens now for interest rates.